sitting here with Kevin Hansen, author of The Restoration of Jonah, a historical novel. Okay, Kevin, what what provoked you to write this? Uh, you know, the story was an idea I had a number of years ago. It was actually a movie idea I had, and I've always loved history, and the story was... I, I saw a map of England, and I just in my head had this little little treasure way to create a treasure with it. And so the story was kind of had its foundation with, with that map and just kind of thinking of a way to create some kind of unique story. And it was actually a movie idea I had, so my initial plan was to write a screenplay, but that never really happened. <laughs> Where did you come up with your characters? Is there an inspiration behind them? Um, the the main character Jonah, I, I don't think I went into the book having never wrote a novel before, and I think that going into it, I didn't know how to create a character. I didn't know how to, you know, put a put the backstory behind who the character was, and so I literally just sat down and started writing. Um, like I said, the story idea came about eight to ten years before I actually started writing the novel so I literally just sat down and started writing and um, I think that as, as I would reread chapters I recognized that Jonah had a lot of the characteristics that I felt I possessed so I don't know if I did that on purpose or it was just some my subconscious did it that way but I think that eventually the main character Jonah is I think really who I think I am in, in a certain amount of ways um as far as the other characters, um, Gabriella was, um, she's Italian, and I think that um, need, she needed to be Italian for a couple different reasons. Um, one, that Jonah's deficiencies with certain things are also my deficiencies, mostly the of language skills. So she being Italian would have those skills that were necessary to complement his skills. And the fact that Italy or the Romans uh, controlled England through, you know, for a thousand years from 600 BC to 400 AD, um, it just made it made sense that she would be from Italy there because there's a lot of Roman history in in England as well. So I think that th those are the really the only two characters that, as I wrote, there was a, a purpose or an idea behind why or who they were. That they needed each other to right to get through the right the treasure. Um, what was the highlight of writing for you? The highlight of the book. Was there a peak point in it that you were? This is what I was going for. This is what I wanted. You know, I think there's highlights for various reasons throughout the book. Um, different for completely different reasons. Um, I, this book really ended up being a very personal journey for me um, as far as going through some of the issues of my life and writing them out through this character. I think, I think it's chapter 24, chapter 25 um, in the Grove of Oak Trees uh, was a very critical chapter for me. It, it, it means a lot to me personally. Um, it's a true story historically, but the, the correlation or the, the parallel I create from the history story to Jonah's own story meant a lot to me. Um, I think that the end of the story, with without giving it away, um, with what happens with the character Marco, I thought was felt inspiration when that happened, when I wrote that. Uh, I wasn't sure what to do with his character, and there was a lot of options. And I really felt like um, some of those options were not possible for me to write certain ways, but it just hit me. So that was a big deal. Um, but I think probably for me, I think it's chapter 24, chapter 25 uh, was really, it, that means a lot to me still. And I'll reread those chapters. And I think a couple things. Number one, did I actually write that? And I will still, at times, get choked up a bit by by reading that those chapters. So those are probably the big ones. And, and the prologue. I think when I first wrote the prologue, 
and got it kind of perfected and then read it as a reader, I recognized that maybe I was writing about myself a little bit. So I think that those are probably, there's, there's lots of stuff through it that I really like, and but those are probably the three areas that felt like they really impacted me the most. The, the beginning, the middle, and the end, I guess, uh, ironically. So. Um, I know when I read it, the when you go back in history and you're telling that story uh, in 1066 A.D., that was, to me, that was fun to read and put together all the pieces um, that are that far back in history. Was that hard for you to do? No, I would, I would guess I'm kind of a history nerd, and um, I've spent many hours for various projects um, researching history. And so those were things I just knew. Um, and I'm not really trying to brag here, but I didn't research anything while I wrote this book. Everything that's in the book historically was stuff that I had just, I knew. And, and they just, I think as the story goes along, um, like when they go to Scotland, I mean, the Cadza Oaks are a story I just knew about, and it just kind of developed into the story. And, and so I think that, you know, you hear about the fact that writers write about what they are very familiar with and comfortable with, and I think that's what I did. I just, in my brain, had all these little stories and legends, and, and I think that as I just wrote, I just started pulling them out of my head. I think there was a little bit toward the beginning, you know, to, to go along southern England, you know, I knew there were certain spaces, places and different events that happened there that I think I mentally knew I would get to, but um, I, I just kind of just relied on my brain and, and some creativity, obviously, you know, some of this obviously didn't happen, but uh, you have to use your creative side to make it all fit, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's what I tried to do with that. And that's what, that's what I loved about the mystery part of it. Um, back in his, when you're, when you're back there and, and you have that, that mystery aspect of a, the treasure hunt type idea for, you know, children in the book was, was fun to read. And, you know. Because you felt like you were there with, with her going like, you know. Right. What can I find? I, you know, and it's funny, when I was a kid, when I was about seven years old, my, my dream was to find a treasure. And I didn't know where it would be. I figured there'd be, you know, I'd have some map with a letter X on it. And <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time as a kid, you know, exploring places and looking for things. And, and growing up in the country, there was some Indian places we would go to. And I always thought I would find a treasure. And then you know, I, I got into sports and, and kind of got away from that. You know, I kind of felt like I was Indiana Jones before Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And and I just think it's funny that, you know, here I am now as an adult. And the first book that I wrote is about finding a treasure. So it's kind of a, you know, kind of came full circle, I think, with it a little bit. Minus the snakes. Right? No snakes. No snakes. <laughs> there will be no snakes in anything I ever write. Um... <clears throat> what do you think Gabriella did for Jonah on different levels? Um, I think on a very, I think on a level, personal level for me, Gabriella was someone who just really kind of loved him for who he was. And, and I think that one of the things that that Jonah says, and this is, I think, in chapter 24, is that he says that Gabriella started looking at my life through my eyes or my world through my eyes. And I think that that's what uh, we want in a, in a companion. Um, there's a great book um, called The Seven Levels of Intimacy. Not to plug someone else's book, but it's a great book. And, and really, that's what it's about. It's about finding that person who just views you for everything you are your faults your weaknesses but your your dreams and your you know your aspirations and so I think that that's what she was for him was someone who just looked at helped look at him as 
and just accepted everything he was and didn't expect anything but but she just kind of looked started feeling him through his eyes and she kind of just wanted to know who he was as a person completely without any expectations and I, I, I felt that that was the same for for her that she had you know he did this he did the same for her as far as right loving her for everything that she was right that she might not have had in the past and I and I think that you know from a personal standpoint that's a hard thing to do it's a hard thing to to have two people who come to a certain point in their life and are ready to be that same thing for both of each other um I I think that's one of the things that you know it's very hard to do but yeah I, I think that, that that Jonah had a um I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say he has because he doesn't really <laughs> exist but Jonah had that ability to just you know view her as a as a great woman and not necessarily you know that all those things that she had experienced in her past so I just think it was a story about two people who kind of came together at the right time and had this, you know, this ability to connect with each other on a level that they hadn't had any experience before. I agree. I There are so many movies out there today that you just watch it and you think it's going to be great and then the other shoe drops. And you're like, man, really? I thought that was going to have a happy ending or, you know, that this was really going to... And personally, reading it myself, I kept thinking, yeah, you know, somebody's got to be up to something. Someone's going to, you know, there's, there's going to be a twist that's going to disappoint. And there never was. There was there was always that connection that they shared and that they were able to um, find those missing pieces in each other. You know, I took a class, a film class, and one of the, the questions at the beginning... Uh, you know, of our semester was why do American movies always have happy endings? And, um, and, and there, there was all this concern or why, why can't they have these weird endings? And I don't know why that's wrong to have just a a good, happy story and a happy ending. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, you know, with, with what happens with Marco, uh, I couldn't make a bad ending with him. (laughs) So I, I just think that that was that was it. I just I wanted it just to be a good story that had a positive ending. And um, there there have been some questions like what's going to happen with Jonah and Gabrielle if there's a part two. And some people think that there should be um, a new woman for Jonah in uh, the next book, um, kind of like Indiana Jones has a new woman in each of his movies. Um, but some people think that. You know he's he's healed and he's found that woman and so maybe they should do this together and and I've thought about both of those and I'm not really sure um, what's going to happen with them. I know I would like to see them back in another book doing something along the same lines. And I've got an idea for a book. I'm writing a couple now, so we'll have to see how it all how it <laughs> just all plays a couple? out. Just, just a just, just a, a few. Couple. <laughs> And you're handwriting them, right? So, handwriting them. Handwriting. Right. It's got to be handwritten. There's a, a, a somebody. Somebody told me something once where they said, "Whatever you write should come from your head, through your heart, and out your hand." And I find that handwriting is more organic. It's more natural. It feels more artistic. I think typing on the computer just can go too fast, and you just it doesn't feel natural. So. Mm-hmm. Everything is everything's handwritten. It's more more you, handwritten. Right. Um, so what what do you predict is next for Jonah? Um, I you know I think that Jonah and if Gabriella tags along or they go together, I could see them becoming like a Indiana Jones team. Um, not necessarily I keep referencing that but <laughs> but I can see them you know spending time together and mm-hmm. using the strengths and weaknesses that they both have and they both complement each other and you know going on a couple other adventures so um, 
that's probably the way I would would lean toward it is keeping them together. Um, I will just say that I think the the idea I had for the next book had to do with Genghis Khan. So we'll have to see we'll have to see how it, how it goes mm-hmm. in the next little while of and, writing. And it felt like they leaned on each other a lot for faith, also, and just secure not just the the physical security, but you know that she believed in something, so it helped him believe in in the same thing. Right. Yeah, and I think especially at the end, you know, her faith was kind of what brought him through some stuff. Um, but I think that you know she had to have faith in him, you know, especially at the very beginning when they kind of go on their adventure together. She had to show some faith that you know her gut was telling her that he was a good guy and that um, that she would be okay, you know, spending time with him alone. And so I think that they both did. They both provided, you know, mm-hmm. a little crutch for each other to lean on at certain times. So definitely, yeah. they've both been hurt enough that they needed that that in each other. Right. When it comes to the treasure, they do find. Um, how was that for you writing writing that? Um, it was it was pretty crazy because it was a long process um, to finish the book and it felt like you know once they found the treasure that I, I could see that light at the end of the tunnel not that I was just trying to finish the book but I think the satisfaction for me to finish it was pretty huge um, but as far as them finding the treasure um, the, the original story was more of a we'll just call it a skeleton idea I had it was just it was a bigger idea but I wasn't sure the details I knew where it would start I knew where it would end but what would happen in the middle I didn't know so the treasure was that thing I have always known and so when, once it got to that point for them it was very satisfying to get there and just finish it and to I don't, I, the ending was just, it was very emotional for me. I think that when I first started writing, I would miss the characters. Um, I would go to bed after writing for seven hours on a Friday night, and I would go to bed at two or three in the morning, and I would want to wake up to start writing again. Um, they became very close and very personal to me, and and toward the end, when, when it was, it was kind of, it was kind of bittersweet. It was good to finish it, but at the same time, it was, uh, you know, writing the end was just, and really the end has just become the beginning with everything else with it. But it was it was very emotional to to get him to that point and then to know that, you know, it's just a couple chapters and, you know, it was over. So, so where, where do you see Jonah going from there? With or without Gabriella? Um, you know, I don't know. I think, you know, going back to, you know, the United States and, you know, spending some time with his, with his children, I think that when you maybe have gone through something as dramatic as he had, that changes you. And so it would be interesting to see what, you know, goes through, you know, his life, you know, from, from the time he gets back home to when they go on their next adventure and um, I don't know I, I you know I think that it was the same thing for me though um, having started this process writing the book and then finishing it my life changed it was probably it was probably a year a good year plus of writing and I t- did take a break in the middle for a few months and um, but yeah, it was it changed me, and so I would imagine that Jonah will come out a different person, um, but maybe not too different. But because I really felt that like Jonah was a pretty good guy all along, but just was unable to really find him have that connection, find himself exactly. So, um, and I don't know if it's ever a, it's ever perfect. I don't know if we're ever perfect in that, but he's at least I think headed in the right direction as far as you know what kind of person he should be and and where he's where if he's headed in the right direction so definitely I think will make him a different father um 
a better, not not that he was bad before, but a stronger, right. I guess, example to his right. children. And I think that's one of the interesting things about this story is that it isn't just a history story to me. It isn't about, you know, Jonah, and it's not a romantic story specifically. It's not a funny story, but I think it has some humor in it. Mm -hmm. But I think it just really kind of, it's almost like you could spend time talking about just the history aspect of it or the personal aspect of it or the emotional aspect of it or... You know, and, and it's, so it's just kind of a little everything. But, but yeah, I think that Jonah has now, at least from the story's standpoint, a lot of the tools that, you know, you need to, you know, just be able to love yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what he was m- missing all along. Yeah, because in the beginning, for sure, from reading the beginning of it, it's he needed that encouragement and love from someone else, the strength from someone else. To make himself feel better, where when you get to the end of the book, where he did get those things from Gabriella, he could go on with, you know, without having to have that constant, right, um, constant voice in his ear. Yeah, you can only have the the support of someone else for a certain period of time before you got to, you know, do it yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, having love from someone else, and that's what I think Jonah's problem was. And I think that he had other relationships that maybe they provided that, but after a while, you got to be able to figure it out yourself. And he wasn't able to do that before. So I, I think that, yeah, you've got to, you know, have that support and have somebody to kind of hold you up. But at some point, you've got to kind of do it on yourself and do it for yourself. Right. Absolutely. Hence the title of the book, The Restoration of Jonah. Right. <laughs> right. Which was a, a process just to get a name for the book. <laughs> so it was probably harder to write the name for the title for the book than it was to write the book itself. But um, it went through three different names. One when I was writing it, one when I first finished it and started getting it published, and then once it was uh edited it changed the name again so that was probably harder than than writing the book (laughs) just come up with a name for it well it's the perfect name um is there a religious aspect to the book do you feel you know there is um and and when i was writing it i i really felt very strongly to keep away from any religious tie-ins or I mean tie-ins isn't the right word but I didn't want it to create any kind of controversy um, or say it's a religious book I just wanted the historical part of the story is very religious and I just wanted it to be something that kind of told the story but wasn't overly and, and di- like like the uh, the Dan Brown book the Da Vinci Code mm-hmm. to me is very religious in a certain way, and I this doesn't have that same right. feel to it, but it has religious aspects of it, and um, maybe religious angles to parts of the story or to the. But a historical part, like a historical religion, versus right. you know any religion in particular. Right. Yeah. The, I don't. I'm not trying to c- claim any, you know, unique new concepts to religion or anything like that it's just using the history of religion to kind of help tell the story and and build the story so okay so tell me more about elizabeth declare well elizabeth is a real person um she was the granddaughter of king edward the first who's long shanks in braveheart lore um she just was a fascinating woman who i'd read about and researched years ago um, my some of my own um, genealogy links through her and so I had kind of done some research just because of the whole royalty thing that you know with grandparents being the kings of England and 
and from from them back it's just it's, it's just all these you know everybody back then the interesting thing about I'm going to switch to topics here for a minute but that's the interesting thing about England is that if you're royalty you just marry royalty and you're always royalty and if you're a peasant you always married a peasant and you stayed a peasant and that's just kind of how the social structure worked so from Elizabeth to Claire backwards in time there's just royalty and from her forward there's a lot of people who were descendants of her who came to the United States as early pilgrims and settled this country the United States and so she was just, to me like a fascinating person and all the things she went through in her own life um, having been married uh, three times uh, from the age of 13 to about 20 early, early 20s and all of her husbands having died um, you know having a couple children of her own and having adopted some of her husband's children that they already had um, she just became this fascinating woman to me and she just did a lot for the poor and she created Clare College within the Cambridge University and she just did a lot of things for people and she just became like this person who I've always known about and researched and so she kind of became this natural um, person to fit into the story as far as the the heroine from the past I guess if you will and so but you know she was just a phenomenal lady and I just thought that she was a natural fit for it so she did a lot of work for good. Mm -hmm. A lot of yeah, good. Yeah, she did. She did a lot of work. And, and and I think there's a book that someone wrote about her and that that she kept these meticulous household records. And so it's a phenomenal, you know, thing, you know, having the fact that she lived in the early 1300s during the um, the Black Plague. She was, was able to survive through that. But... Um, it's this great historical record of all these housekeeping things and how much it costs for, and it does show how lavish some of her parties were though. I mean, <laughs> you know, like there's people starving to death and yet she's holding these parties that are, you know, massive, but, um, you know, she was very wealthy and, and did a lot of really good though. And from the book, it's carried on today still. The, her name and her yeah yeah and uh, obviously I had to make up some things about <laughs> her and um, you know there there is no there could be a, a rose garden with her name I don't I haven't found one but there, there's some stuff that I did have to fabricate you know about her to to make the story work but but not, it seems like it's from what from what I can understand, it doesn't seem like it's anything that's too far fetched. No, I don't. I don't of, think so. Of what could really be, you know, right. something that she would have done. Right. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a, a stretch to say that she would have done, you know, what she does in the book, you know, from a real from the real person that she was. Okay. What kind of um, we might have already covered this, but impact um, was it on Jonah for the treasure they found with or without Gabriella just the sheer um, well I think from a, a religious standpoint Gabriella was probably more in tune spiritually um, than, than Jonah ever was I think that finding it without giving away too much of it, I think was a big deal for him. Obviously, it was had some other, you know, life's changing, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Life-changing things that happen in lots of different ways, you know, physically and probably more spiritually and emotionally. Um, I think that, you know, finding the treasure for him was a big deal but I think that the things that happened because of the treasure um, with Gabriella's faith probably was a bigger deal for him you know from a spiritual standpoint but and I'm, I would assume that Gabriella the, grew up with that faith Italian based right they were very religious people um Right, and, and Jonah, you know, 
being being from Idaho, I think that I, I referenced that Jonah was from the mountain northwest. I don't remember how I phrased it, but but he lived in Boston. So, um, again, I think that that's a lot of you know me. Not that I don't have faith or anything, but you know that we all go through struggles in life, and and maybe Jonah was just at one of those down down points of his life, and. And that felt very natural for me to understand how it would feel to be there. Um, you know, we all go through ups and downs, and and I think that he probably just was one of those parts where maybe he wasn't, you know, just just felt like you know maybe he's on his own in life, or you know, life ch- changes and you have ups and downs and things. You know, his his divorce and it had been spurned enough that it was a, a down point, right? So I, I think that he probably had the faith, but it just was buried a bit and uh, needed a little bit of help and and uh, prodding and coaxing to get it out, to, to have it come out in him a little bit. Hence the restoration. <laughs> That's right. Um, was it the, is the book the ending that you had thought it would be all along? Um, I don't think it is. Um I think with Jonah's children, uh, especially Lily, um, I think that the way the book ends with the treasure kind of hit me toward the end. Um, again, without giving it away, um, I think that I think it was a perfect ending, and the way that things were dealt with, and the way that things happen I think it was just the perfect ending and I, I, I do have to say one thing and about the naming in the book um, Jonah's name actually when I first started writing it was Ian and as I as I read wrote through probably the first third to a half of the story um, it just didn't feel right um, I think Ian to me felt like a blonde and I just Jonah was not that and so I changed his name and Gabriella's name is just uh, you know I just tried to think up some Italian name um, calling her Giada probably was a little too weird but um, every name I think in the book has some significance to me uh, my grandmother was born in England and her, um, her name is Daisy and my great grandfather was an avid gardener, and so his other daughter's name was Lily, and so um, that is where I pulled the name Lily. Uh, I also have a niece named Lily, but I just thought that yeah, every every name, every place in there has some sig- significance, or I created, you know, a name to to match something that meant something to me. And um, but yeah, that was that was kind of interesting to stop and have a new character come in and. And try to figure out what to name them, and you know, spend two minutes going through your head trying to go through a list of friends or acquaintances or coworkers or whatever, trying to find a, a name for someone. But that that's probably one of the harder parts for me too. Well, I think in also in describing characters like you do in the book, it's easy to go, "Oh, yep, I could see that person <laughs> name that." And you have goat herders and uh, sheep herders. Right, <laughs> that, yep, I can see somebody out there that you can hardly understand. <laughs> right, yeah, I think the Angus, you know, I. This might be way too personal, but you know, I do like the the ACDC, and you know, they're, you know, Angus Young, their lead guitarist, is from Scotland, but moved to Australia, and that was the inspiration for, <laughs> that was the inspiration for the name Angus, but. And I think Gabriella, personally, I think that's a great Italian name. And it, it just it sounds as pretty as she's described. You know, and that was one of the things about... I've had some people mention to me, like, I always mention how tall people are in the story. And I guess it's just... That's just one of those things for me. I... Being fairly tall myself, and... Um, I just... Rec- I, I just notice height all the time. And um, I noticed the guy at the grocery store that's five seven, and his wife or girlfriend's five nine. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I see those things, mm-hmm. and so I think describing someone 
and what their height is puts a more of a real character characteristic of their you know their physical being you know in, Much in someone's easier mind to visualize. Right. so and that's why I do that I, I'm sure and that that's a bonus I, I whenever I read a book I always try and either pick an actor or visualize someone to play that part of who I'm reading and having every description possible of that person helps right and then it makes it that much more realistic to you as you read the story right and and part of that was um you know being I was adopted and being six foot four um I remembered my grandmother or my grandmother and my grandfather they both passed away when I was about five or six years old and I just remembered my grandfather being this massive man and you know that's just always been the impression I've had in my head for you know my life and a number of years ago I found out you know he's only like five eight five seven five eight five nine somewhere Mm -hmm. on there and so it all of a sudden put a little more context in who he was you know, being a, a five-year-old and seeing this man, he looked massive, but, um, you know, not so much. Hmm. So, and I think that's why I do it is just make some, make some more real and perspective. Right. Um, how closely are all the characters in the book based on actual people in your life? Um, the historical people, I think, are fairly accurate. Obviously, you know, like we talked about, there's mm-hmm. some stuff we had to make up or change. But as far as the people in my life, um, I guess everybody has, you know, I think everybody I wrote about, there's just little threads, there's strands or threads of people I know running through them. Um, you know, there, there aren't a lot of people in the book. I mean, there's just some people who kind of pass through the story. Um, there's the, there are the historical people in the story, but, you know, Gabrielle and Jonah really are the main characters, and everybody else just kind of flows, you know, in and out of the story at various times. But um, I think most, most of the characters were, you know, they're named for someone I know, but maybe not necessarily having the, the, the personality characteristics of that person. So I think each character is just is created as I start writing. And I think that's one of the, the things I've done in writing the story was I wouldn't know what was coming out the next sentence when I would be writing. So, for instance, when they go to the uh, they go to an antique store, um, the, the old man in there, I, I mean, I didn't know that there was an old man in that store when they walked into the store. So it's just I kind of just saw this character in my head, and I would just start writing. And I'm sure that subconsciously I'm throwing in pieces of lots of different people I know. Um, you know, he had the big cardigan sweater, I th- I think, with you know, reminded me of like a Mister Rogers type mm-hmm. thing, and just, but just a little bit oversized. And and probably in my head I had a little bit of the the old man in the Pixar cartoon that plays chess against himself. You know, I kind of mm-hmm. had that image in my head. Of, but no, I think that there's lots of different pieces and strands of people in it, but maybe not anybody specific that, that you know I'm writing about or that you know has any kind of meaning that way. Does the character of Marco have any symbolism? I mean, not not necessarily personally, but <laughs> that, uh, that would um, en- envelop someone or even a a concept or you know I I would guess I don't I've never thought about that but I think he probably he probably does and um, I think that that growing up I was very nice and very kind and I tried to be a good person and I wasn't an arrogant jock or and and I think that maybe I didn't really necessarily care for people who were that way sometimes and so I probably wrote, he was probably a compilation of all of the, the negatives that I see in other guys. Evils. Right. You know, a little arrogant and mm-hmm. into themselves and abusive and, and 
you know so I probably he's just probably a compilation of just a lot of people that maybe have all those characteristics that I don't really care for in other people so <laughs> um, but yeah I, he just kind of developed as well as the story went along so I enjoyed it thoroughly I, I like the adventure part of it um, you know the is, is it Elizabeth that's as the young girl that climbs the staircase and you know her little adventure that she gets to go on um, so personally it had just everything in it that, uh, that hit all the spots that kept my interest and it pieced together everything so it wasn't just a your typical book it was it, it had everything for me well I'm glad you liked it um, I, I loved writing it um, I loved allowing my sense of humor to come out through parts of it um, I loved having maybe my artistic side you know the, there's the scene with the, the sheep you know <laughs> leaning, leaning up on the fence I just think that that would be a, would be a, a, been a great picture and so I just loved having letting my creativity go and my mind and imagination go wherever it wanted to and but yeah, I, I enjoyed it, and I appreciate that. I just, I think that every kid has this, you know, adventure and this side of them that wants to discover something or find something or, or whatever. And and so I guess in a way, Elizabeth found it, and then Jonah as an adult got to find it as well. So I don't know. It was, it was a lot of fun to write, and it was a great experience. Cool. Or I'm ready for another one, so you can, <laughs> you can get started writing the next one. I will. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time. So. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome.